Okay, we are at the easy part of the lecture because there's literally going to be one line that you're going to have to write on, on your notes for this part. Well, yeah, maybe two. Um, and so basically, I'm not going to need any of this board. I'll need, I'll need maybe this much of this, uh, which is really nice. And that's because I'm just going to write something without really any explanation at all. So the first thing we're going to start off with is we, we just talked about uh, probability functions over continuous variables. And that's exactly what the Schrodinger equation is based on. We're going to have some function. We're going to call it, at least for now, capital Psi. I think it's PSI, but you, you call it Psi. And it's a function not only of space x, but of time t. And from here on out, I'm, I'm just going to omit the x and the t part, but it's, it varies both in time and space, is, is to be entirely clear. So, the next thing I'm going to write is, in fact, the Schrodinger equation. I h bar. Now, I is the, the imaginary letter, uh, or the imaginary variable squared of minus 1. I h bar, d psi, dt, equals minus h bar squared over 2m, d squared psi, uh, I need to make that two strokes, d squared psi over dx squared plus, I'll move over here, something called v of x psi. So I guess I lied just a little bit. Now, I said I wasn't going to write anything else, and I'm not, so there we go. But with that said, I do want to give a very short, just kind of interesting realization that this function there, which we will next time, we'll talk about what it actually means, um, it does directly relate to probability of something. But a couple things that we can immediately note. Number one, the left-hand side has an imaginary number. Notice that nowhere on the right-hand side do we see an imaginary number. So what that means is that you can't have an equation where the left-hand side is purely imaginary and the right-hand side is purely real. So immediately we know, without having any clue what the heck this means, we know that psi has to at least have some component that's imaginary. We can't get around using imaginary numbers now. And to be honest, that actually makes things a lot easier for us in the end. So, number one, this function is in fact at least partly imaginary. Now, number two, we see that on the left-hand side, there is a single partial derivative with respect to time. And we, knew, we already knew that it depends on time here. But on the right-hand side, there is a second-order partial with respect to space. This kind of somewhat, if we can ignore this part here, it kind of somewhat looks like what we call the wave equation. Um, and that's, we'll, we'll discuss this more as well. But hopefully you've seen in discussing specifically light waves and um, uh, Maxwell's equations, there is some, some equations that have a partial with respect to time, it's usually a second order, but a partial with respect to time on one side, and a, par uh, a partial with respect to space on the other, usually both second order. So this at least gives us some hint that the solutions for the wave equation classically might have something to do with the Schrodinger equation here. And in fact, the most useful solutions for this are, in fact, solutions for wave equations. So you'll see what this means as well. But it predicts there might be something like waves. And if you recall, way back when, de Broglie had said, hey, what if quantum things have wave-like nature? So that's kind of a useful result number two. Uh, number three, without describing anything about this, there is a strictly spatial part here, strictly spatial part there. Something or another about this helps to modify our function that allows for what we call inhomogeneous solutions. I don't want to get any more about that either, but there is a certain class of differential equations that are useful to know for solving this. And turns out the psi variable in, in certain cases where that equals zero is what we need. And the last thing that I want to say, 
is that of these three terms here, notice the occurrences of that h-bar. It's squared there, it's linear there, and it's non-existent here. What this implies is that somewhere hidden within our variable psi is some measure of, of space, which is really what this h-bar tells us. It's measure of energy or space or time, but it, it only applies on the tiniest scales possible when we're dealing with single photons or transitions between the tiniest amounts of energy. And in order for the left-hand side to be on the same scales as the right-hand side, very definitely there must be some instance of h-bar or at least some inherent scale that this function applies on. In order for the left-hand side, which only has one of those, to be on the same order as this here, which has two or none. So there's a whole lot we can get out of here without having any clue what it actually means, but this is where the excitement begins and the frustration also unfortunately begins for many people. Um, but what we're gonna basically spend the entire rest of the semester now doing is figuring out physically what does this actually tell us and then solving it to actually see su uh, things such as not only like why are there you know, orbitals within the hydrogen atom, but the really cool result of this is you can literally build up the entire periodic table of the elements. And you can, we, we can develop a, what I think is a pretty fundamentally, you know, intuitive understanding of the 1s2, 2p3 orbitals. Uh, if, you, if you've taken a chemistry class, all of those electron orbitals are given funny names. Uh, 1s, 2s, 3p, 4d, and so on. Each of these energy shells are different solutions for this equation, and this, Letter psi tells us what each of those the orbitals actually looks like mathematically. So uh, there's many other aspects of this as well, but I think that's really kind of one of the crowning achievements that I do hope that we're going to get to here. So welcome to the Schrodinger equation, and it's downhill from, well, it, I don't want to say it's downhill from here, but this is the start of the real quantum mechanics right here.